Good afternoon. Today is July 25th, 2015. My name is Nancy Uphoff. I am conducting an oral history interview at the Leroy American Legion Post 79 in Leroy, Illinois with Fred Haney. Please state your name and address for the record. Fred E. Haney, 216 East Fittersley Road, Washington, Illinois, 61571. Which war did you serve in? Vietnam War. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. What was your age? What similarities or differences do you see? Were you live, uh, where were you living at the time? I was living in Washington, Illinois. Were you single or married? Single. Why did you join? Well, one reason, initially I wanted to go in the Marine Corps right after high school. My dad was a former Marine who fought World War II, and he told me, he said, we're going to make a deal. And I said, what's that? He said, I don't want you going now. He didn't want me going because I wanted to be a Marine. He said, you got to be one crazy SOB to be a Marine. So I made him a deal. I'd go to college two years, and after that it was up to me what I wanted to do. My heart wasn't in college, so it wasn't. Two years went kind of fast, and I joined the Air Force. And you just answered my next question about why did you pick that branch of the service. Do you recall your first uh, few days in the service? Your first days? Yeah, my wife my wife doesn't understand this because I went in just before Thanksgiving. I mean just before, like the 20, 20 couple of days before. And then again, I was in my basic training during Christmas too. My wife finds it hard to believe that I consider that Christmas Eve and that uh, Thanksgiving day uh, a, a good Thanksgiving, good Christmas. And she says, why? You didn't have your family. I said, yes, I did. Everybody that was in basic when I was in basic was away from their family. We were all in the same boat. I consider all of us family. So it wasn't that hard for me. Basic training wasn't that hard for me. How some people could talk about wanting to go over the hill. United States Air Force basic training back then was only six weeks instead of eight weeks. It was like growing up Boy Scouts. It wasn't much of anything. Um, so what were your feelings when you were in basic training? Uh, I don't know, you know, it, you're new to the military, so you're, you've got to get used to their way of doing things, which again, it wasn't hard, and you did miss your family and stuff, but I didn't find anything overly hard. Uh, what happened after I graduated basic? was a little different, was I think worse than basic. You did it. Awesome. If you want to know about that now, I'll tell you now. Go ahead. When I left basic training, they put us in tech school, and mine was inventory management specialist tech school. Well, we got off of, off the plane, we left San Antonio, Texas in November, it was nice and bright and sunny, and we landed in Denver, and it was snowing, and we just got our first strike, and you're feeling super proud because you got your first strike instead of no strike. You get off the plane and they assign you to an, an old World War II barracks like all, most of ours were at that time. And there's a guy that wears a rope. The ropes came in three colors, red, yellow, and green. Red was like God, green was like uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, yellow was like a follower. And these guys almost had more, more uh, I don't know, they, they thought they were better than drill instructors and that's how they treated you. I remember when we went in our barracks, there were open bay, a big aisle right down the center, beds on this side, beds on that side. And as you walk up the stairs, you had the old vinyl rubber runner on the wood stair. So the runner was like this, and you had this much wood on this side of the runner, this much wood on this side of the runner. Well, I was, I was assigned to the second floor, so I, along with some of the other guys, started walking up the vinyl rubbers, vinyl run, runners. And the red, red rope was like God. You can't walk on that vinyl rubber. That belongs to me. You got to straddle that. So you had to, like a duck, straddle it all the way to the second floor. 
So then you get up to the second floor, and he says, fill that side first and this side second. So you get the big aisle in the middle. You walk right down the big aisle. Stay off my damn aisle. That belongs to me. If you're going to go down there, you walk around. That big aisle's mine, just like the center of that stairway's mine. And then uh, if you were talking to some other recruits at the time, and a rope went by, like I said, they were like God. You had to give them the respect by saying, stand by. And that was a, lo a loose parade rest. It wasn't a tension. You didn't salute them, and it wasn't a stiff parade rest. But the honor you gave them because they had a rope. No more strikes in you, just a rope. You had to go to a loose parade rest mm -hmm. for honor. And that, to me, was just, we didn't do that in basic. And one other thing we had to do, and that pair of uh, utility pants is upstairs. It's not on display, but it's upstairs. We had to take one of our pair of fatigues, that was our greens, they call them ABUs now, they call them fatigues. We had to take one of them, starch it so bad, that if you had your combat boots standing right here, one boot here and one boot there, you had to take that pair of pants without you and put it in each, each leg and each boot, and it would have to stand all by itself. That's how bad we had to starch it. it and then just, you had to wear it? Oh no. Okay. No. <laughs> Good. So where was your boot camp? Uh, San Antonio, uh, Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Uh, did you get to go home on leave after boot camp, or did you go to your? I went to my school. Your school. Yeah. Then after your school, your is technology. Tech school. Tech school. Then did you get to go home before you went? Well, actually, my my tech school was already full, so they didn't have an opening. So I I got. I was put in something called PATS, Personnel Away in Tech School. Mm -hmm. And the stuff I just told you about continued until I got to my tech school. Mm -hmm. And I decided I was going to get married, and I had already proposed to my wife I was going to get married when I got home on leave. Mm -hmm. Well, because my tech school started late, my wife had all the invites set way made up, and she had, to change, she had to get them back, pen and ink, change the dates on them. And then they were going to, they still didn't have a place for me to go, so I talked to the base chaplain, and they got it all straightened out. I was able to get married on a second date instead of my first date. Uh huh. Um, so, do you remember any of your instructors? Yes. Uh, my uh, drill instructor, his name was Staff Sergeant Scalise. S C A L I S E. And his immediate boss would would have been he he was the drill instructor, and my team leader was Tech Sergeant Bright B R I G H T. We kind of, after you were in base a while, you kind of got to like him, Tech Sergeant Scalise, and you didn't particularly like Tech Sergeant Bright. You knew that Tech Sergeant Bright drove a VW, and you knew that Tech Sergeant Scalise drove a Mustang. So if you saw the Mustang outside, you thought, ah, it's going to be better than if you saw a VW outside. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of the way that went. But they were both pretty good guys. Now, I don't remember, I don't remember any of my Tech I don't remember any of my tech school instructors except one of my second tech, because I had two tech schools. I remember one of my second tech school instructors, but my first tech school, no, I don't remember any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any special buddies? Did you have any special buddies at boot camp? No, not really. Mm -hmm. um, so you served during the Viet Vietnam era war, and you were stationed, where were you stationed? I went to tech school in Denver, mm -hmm. and then I was stationed at Grand Forks Air Force Base, Grand Forks, North Dakota, mm -hmm. for a little over a year, and then in between that time, my twin brother joined the Air Force. So then when my twin brother, this is funny now, when my twin brother went to basic training, he ran into my drill instructor, and my drill instructor wanted to know, what the hell are you doing back a second time? And I said, you must have had my twin brother. He didn't have me. He was running the confidence course, and he remembered, and remembered the crazy last name. And then this story kind of continues. We went to the exact same tech school, but six months apart. So when he went through tech school, he met one of my instructors. Didn't have him. He just met him, and they remembered me. And then when I graduated tech school, I was bound and determined I'm getting married when I go home on leave. I couldn't get married until I was counseled by the base chaplain to not get married. My pay was low, my rank was low, and they thought it would be too much of a hardship. Well, I went through all that counseling. I married my wife, and my wife and I had been married 46 years. Well, then my brother decided he was going to get married after tech school. 
he had to see the base chaplain to get counsel. He saw the same base chaplain I saw. So we're identical twins now. And then when you graduate when you graduate tech school, you fill out what they call a dream sheet. That says you could go anywhere you wanted to go, stateside or overseas, as long as it was in your career field. Fill it out, one, two, three, because you might get it. It was called a dream sheet because your chances of getting it were. <laughs> well, my brother thought I was at Ellsworth Air Force Base in Rapid City, so he filled it out, and guess what? He got Ellsworth Air Force Base in Rapid City, except I was in Grand Forks, North Dakota, not Ellsworth, South Dakota. So then I requested a transfer to his base, because identical twins back then had a 90% chance of being stationed together just by requesting it, other than a combat zone. So I requested it, and I got to the same base he was at. We were in the same building. You come in to see him, and back then we hadn't computerized supply yet. Everything was on a piece of paper. You didn't quite believe what my twin brother told you, so you wanted to see paperwork that backed everything up he told you. He would send you down to the other end of the hallway to see me, <laughs> identical twins. Sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, it, it was. <laughs> what was your job uh, assignment at? Initially? Yes. Uh, the, the first tech school I took was inventory management school. It was kind of like uh, keeping track of issues and purchases and shipments and stuff like that and handling the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And like I said, until computers took over, which I cross-trained into that field later, everything was backed up by paperwork. Mm -hmm. Now my second tech school was computer tech school and that's where I actually learned how to run a computer. And back then computers were nice like this. There were two truckloads of equipment, mm -hmm. and I ran a computer back then. I don't touch them now. I got one. My wife's got one. I don't touch it. Mm -hmm. Now, you told me that you spent your time in the service in the States right. as support for the uh, soldiers. And yeah, it would have been, since I was with Strategic Air Command, B-52 bombers came out of Strategic Air Command. And the two bases I was at uh, had B-52 bombers, especially Ellsworth. Did you, do you know anybody who died in Vietnam? I know, my one, my wife knows one guy, I know her mostly by name from high school because he's a year behind me. And then occasionally I'll see somebody's name on the wall or something, it'll ring a bell, but I really don't remember them that much. Mm -hmm. They weren't real buddy buddies with me. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of your most memorable experiences in your job? In my job itself, well, if, if we're talking about when, you know, all the, the kind of tricks my brother and I experienced, <laughs> were, that was funny. A lot of people hear that and think that's funny, but um, I, got, I got married when I was in the military, and I was pretty young. I was 21 when I got married, just turned 21 when I got married. Um, and. I was first stationed in North Dakota, and my boy was my oldest boy was born on January 16th, 1970, and it was so cold in North Dakota. I rented a trailer, a real small trailer, and when I rented it was like summer. And it was okay, comfortable, but not it's about what I could do. It's about what the chaplain was supposed to talk to. Out of not getting married, and that kind of thing. Well, when my wife was in the hospital having Joe, my first son, it was so damn cold out. My trailer would not heat to more than 40 degrees. My wife's in the hospital having a baby, and I'm taking about every cover I got and covering myself up just to stay warm. I even got a little frostbite working outside, trying to put half snow against the trailer, insulate it a little, like an igloo. Didn't work, I got a little frostbite. I had a neighbor. He was in the Air Force, he was uh, security police, African American, and built, built like a weightlifter, just really built nice. And he was married to an African American woman, and she was just like the lady on the Aunt Jemima pancake batter box. And they told me, Fred, when your wife gets out of the hospital, there's no way in hell your wife and that baby are going in that trailer. You live here with us until we find a different place for you to stay. So I spent my off time from work finding a place in town to stay, and I eventually found a place to stay. But they were kind of like, I don't know what you call them, 
babysitters to my first kid, but they were just a wonderful couple. Mm -hmm. My wife kept in contact with them for a little while, but not, not lately. Uh -huh. um, that was my next question, if you kept in contact with any of your uh, co-workers. But uh, from basic to case, so no, because uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, none of them went to none of them went to the same tech school I went to. None of them went to the same base that I went to. So you mm -hmm. just kind of separated that for tech schools. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about some of the awards and medals or me um, medals and citations that you received. Well, when I was stationed in North Dakota, they had a supply airman of the month. One of the month. I don't know how you were nominated, but I got nominated for that and went before a board and they asked me questions and then, you know, your picture was put up in supply. That's the only real award I got. I got a national defense ribbon, but anybody that serves in time of war gets a national defense ribbon. And then I got a, I, was, I didn't have any big problems when I was in the Air Force, so I got an Air Force Good Conduct ribbon. And then I got an outstanding unit citation. I can't remember really what that was for, but sometimes a unit gets it, and you may not know why your unit got it, but you were part of the unit, so you got to wear you got to wear the ribbon. Those are the only three I had. Now, when you were in North Dakota, your family was with you the whole time you were there. No, when I first when I first got the trailer, my wife was still living at home, and she was getting things in order, and then. We had gotten married in between, and she, along with my sister, drove to North Dakota to that trailer, and then from then on, we were together the whole time, my wife and me and my two kids as they came along. Mm -hmm. um, what was the most pressure or stress that you felt in your work? And I mean, you knew where the things you were working on were going to go. Um, how did you feel about that and the work you were doing? And well, a lot of the stuff we did was just routine computer. I'm going back to computers now. Mm -hmm. Supply was just shuffling paper that first time. That wasn't much mm -hmm. of anything. But when I was in the, in the computer room, there were times we actually had to run secret programs. I had a secret security clearance. And that was kind of funny because prior to going into the computer room, I had to learn the peripheral equipment, equipment, uh, uh, equipment that was used to break down the computer stuff. Like they had an interpreter, that, I don't know if you're familiar with punch cards. Okay, punch cards, you had your information that was punched in and then it, it could go through a program on an interpreter and that interpreter would read the punches and put it in a certain order on top of the card and print it. So I had to know how to run an interpreter, I learned that first. I had to learn roughly how to do a being a key punch operator, which I did, and then I had to learn how to break down the big sheets of paper, the big reports that came off the computer were like huge, mm -hmm. and strength of row after row after row, and then uh, you had to know how to use the, all of, all that equipment, that output equipment, and then, uh, let's see, when we did the secret programs, you had to lock the room going into the PCAM room, you had to lock the room going into the computer room, you had to lock the back room going into the computer room, then you can run the programs. Not quite. The interpreter that read the punch cards has a ribbon about this big, about a dime around. Well, that ribbon had to come out, and the brand new ribbon had to go in. And then when you were done using that piece of equipment for your secret project you were running, you had to take that new ribbon that you put in out, put the old ribbon you had in back in, and then you would give them their new ribbon back because they were afraid there might be secret data on there. Now, the same thing happened with the key punch. If you punched a card and the card aired, you had to give them back that air card. You couldn't just go like this and throw it in a trash basket. So you gave any any output that might have possibly been uh, damaged goods, so to speak, you had to give back to them. And then the printer, because if the printer sheets of paper were like this, it had a ribbon that was like about this big around and about as wide as the sheet of paper. That whole ribbon had to come out. You had to put a brand new ribbon in there. And then when you were all done running their program, even if it just punched, printed one piece of paper, you had to pull out their brand new ribbon, give it back to them, put your old ribbon back in. And that was the most common, one of the oddest things we had to do, but one of the most comical things was when I was a, just got back from tech school. 
and we had Air Force end of month and uh, Strategic Air Command end of month. And you had a lot of reports those two weekends. Uh, Air Force end of month wasn't real bad, and Strategic Air Command end of month was a little bit worse, but we had some programs that you could run a program for like seven or eight hours, and it wouldn't do a thing. It wouldn't punch a card, it wouldn't print a sheet of paper, it wouldn't do anything, just sort. You had all these little lights you could watch, you know, they, they sorted. And kind of, they told us, you know, if you're running that program, it might take six or seven hours. You want to lock the computer room up, go take a walk in the supply shop and be our guest. They didn't care. Well, I'm sitting there running this program, I said, damn, this is taking a long time to get any output. And then I'm looking at it, like, something's wrong, I gotta call, I gotta call my immediate supervisor, Sergeant Steele. So I called him at home, I said, Sergeant Steele, I'm not getting any output on this program, what's the matter? He said, well, I'll probably come in, but he said, I think you were in a loop. And what a loop is, if you have to know how to wash out the lights real close. The lights will go, and then they'll, they'll loop. The same lights will go, and the same lights will go. Mm -hmm. You're in a loop then, and you're not gonna get anywhere being in a loop. So he had to come in, get me out of the loop. Sometimes it's a problem with the program, then you might have to reload the old program and run it under a low pump. I wasted so much time that it felt like a fool. <laughs> well, at least you called him. <laughs> um, do you recall the day your service ended? Uh, I don't remember that much of it, and I'll tell you why. When I was uh, when I was stationed with my wife and my two kids in Rapid City, South Dakota. On June 9, 1972, Rapid City was hit by an enormous flood. I don't mean one of these little things you hear about here in Illinois. This was a big one. It killed 250 people. Well, prior to the flood hitting, I was running an apartment on the highest spot in Rapid City. Because normally in the uh, tourist season, those apartments were rented to tourists. But in the off season, you could rent them for three or four months. So that's where I was. But Prior to that, I was living, I had to go live in a trailer then. After that, I lived in a trailer. And when the flood hit, my trailer was, I don't know, maybe 70 yards away from a creek that overflowed. I had to go to work that night, 12 hour shifts. My wife called me and called me and called me. She said, the water's getting closer and closer and closer to the trailer. So she called the guy that we rented the trailer from and he came out and got my wife and kids. My wife called me, let me know that she was home and she was okay. The next day I went to see my trailer. This is my trailer. This is the creek. Trailer should stand like this. Trailer was like this on the side. Water coming in this way, dry this way. I actually walked inside of it hoping it wouldn't go in the drink. I had to salvage what I could. So my last six months I didn't have any places for my family. So I sent them home to live with my parents. And I lived in the barracks again, just like I was in basic training. Uh -huh. Except that's kind of funny because I was in supply, so I assumed I'm going to the supply barracks. So I did. I went to the supply barracks. I got a room. Oddly enough, my roommate was from Peoria. I'm mm -hmm. from Washington. Well, the thing is, he was in jail more than he was in the room, so the room was kind of to myself. And the first sergeant had told me, Fred, you're in the wrong room. I said, no, I'm not. I'm in the supply barracks. No, your rank, I was a staff sergeant, your rank gave you the right to go in with all the sergeants, the lifers, the careers. I said, do I have to go there? He said, well, not really, but he said, if I really need the room, you got to go. I said, you got a deal. So I spent my last time, my last six months living in that barracks and, you know, writing, writing my wife almost daily and calling her. But I, I think I might have gone home on leave one time. And the cutest thing about it is my twin brother was in the uh, Air Force at the time, too. He would go home on leave. My two young boys were staying with my mom and dad. They'd see, they'd see my twin brother and they'd call him daddy. <laughs> or they, my oldest boy would look up in the sky and he knew I was in the air force and he'd see an air plane go like, Daddy, please come down. <laughs> um, that was my roughest time. So, when you were away from your family? Yeah, and, yeah. and, 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 and all the garbage I went through with the flood and the cold weather in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do after you got out of the military? Well, actually, just before I went in, uh, I was working at Pat's Touring Company in Peoria Heights where my dad worked. And I had actually taken a leave of absence from my full-time job, which was there. 
and so that I had a right to have that job back. The other job I could have could have tried to get was a computer operator, but the thing is, I would have had to give up my seniority for four years in the military for this other job. The other job, you know, half of what I was getting going back. And with two kids, you go with the money. And that's what I did. I went with the money and gave up on staying in computers. Did you ever think about going back to school? I never did, no. I never gave thought to that. Um, do you keep in contact with any of your service friends? No. Um, I graduated. I graduated next year. It'll be 50 years ago. I graduated high school. I went to one reunion. That's my fifth year reunion. I haven't been to one since. A year later, my wife has her reunions. If she wants to go, I take her, so she doesn't have to worry about drinking and driving. She doesn't drink anyway, and I don't anyway now. But I just make sure that her and her girlfriend get there and come back safely. And I, even the people that I went to high school with, I probably knew better than some of the people I went to service with. And I found out that going to one reunion, most of the people that had their nose in the air back then have their nose in the air now. And I just have no desire at all to go to any of my reunions. Do you belong to any veterans yeah. organization? Uh, I'm the American League in Post 100 Washington. I'm a, I've been elected to another two-year term as a executive board member, and when that's over with, I'll have eight years continuance as a board member. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I'll have gone through four commanders. Um, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Oh yeah, I've always, I have like, especially now, I have so much respect for people that serve now. Uh, I had a, my brother, my twin brother's son spent recently 18 years in the Army. He was uh, discharged about two years ago. He was in Iraq, Afghanistan, Haiti. He started out as a private, worked all the way up to a warrant officer too, which is about the highest enlisted rank you could get. And then the Army wouldn't let him finish out his 20-year hitch. They gave him less less choice less of a choice by staying in or, or staying or going out now and he didn't like any of the choices but one i said well, take the one you like and just get the hell out but i tell kids like when i work the wall I'll, there'll be a group of kids with a parent and i'll say i want to ask your kids something do you know anybody a teacher an aunt an uncle uh, a brother or sister that serves that they say no they don't i said well you don't know him? And he says, no. And I said, well, do you ever thank one of them if you see him on the street in uniform? And he said, no. And I said, well, have you, have you ever thought about thanking him? And he said, well, not really. And I, I went out and out to him. Why the hell not? Mm -hmm. I said, if you knew right now there's about 330 million Americans serving our uh, living in the country, we're protected by less than 1% of that in the military. Mm -hmm. That's something, and there's no draft. So these people that serve now, if they don't deserve a hand, say, shake who the hell does? Mm -hmm. And I do something special at the wall, and I usually tell the Vietnam vets, sir, did you serve in Vietnam? They said, yeah. And I said, for me to you, I'd like to do something special, but I need your permission. So what is that? I said, three things. I want to shake your hand, I want to say welcome home, and I want to give you a man-to-man -man hug. Any problems with any of that? Some say skip the man-to-man -man hug, I'll take the... A guy the other day took all three of them, and we got them hugging. He was crying. It's happened more than once. Tell me about what you've been doing with the wall. Oh, I started the, the way I got started in the wall. My brother-in-law was first of all he met my oldest brother in Vietnam, and my oldest brother introduced him to my sister, and that's how they got married. And that's how he's my brother-in-law. He was mayor of Chillicothe, Illinois, in 2007, and he was bringing the wall to Chillicothe. And he asked me if I wanted to help, and I said, yeah. And then he put me down for security, and then I had a day off, so on my day off, I'm doing what I do now. I'm a wall walker. I can tell people, like what I told you about the wall. Mm -hmm. I can tell them that kind of stuff. And basically what happened is I got hooked on it. And then in, about six months later, it was in Bloomington, and I worked there about a month later. It was in Morgan, I worked there. And if it's in a relatively immediate area of my house and I can get to it easily like I do here other than an hour drive, I just love doing it. Mm -hmm. People have asked me, do you get paid for it? No. Why not? I said, I'm a volunteer. Don't you think you should get paid? I said, no. There's 58,300 names on the wall. That's all I need. That's that's my satisfaction. I'm remembering them. And so that's, that's why I kind of hooked on it. Can you tell me again that 
the numbers you told me when we were standing out there? Oh boy, At least okay. some of them? Yeah. Uh, there's 58,300 names on the wall of veterans that died while serving in Vietnam. The youngest one to have served and died in Vietnam was probably the first class Dan Bullock. Dan is a United States Marine. He's dead, but he is a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Dan was 15 years old when he died in Vietnam. His name appears on the wall. There's five 16-year-olds on the wall. There's 12 17-year-olds on the wall. The oldest person on the wall is 62. Approximately 25,000 of the names on the wall are 20 years of age or younger. 17,000 of those on the wall are married. On their very first day in Vietnam, I think the number is 997 troops ever made it to day two. Their first day in Vietnam was the last day of their life. On their last day in Vietnam, approximately 1,450 never made it home because their last day in Vietnam was the last day of their life. There's uh, 7,500 women that appear on the wall. No, 7,500 women that served. Eight of those women appear on the wall and they were nurses. One of those nurses was First Lieutenant Sharon Ann Lane. She was a nurse tending to a wounded soldier and her medical facility was hit by a rock that fell grenade and she lost her life at the age of 25. There's 2,930 names on the wall from the state of Illinois. There's three sets of a father and son on the wall. There's 40 sets of brothers on the wall. There were 771 prisoners of war during, during the Vietnam War. 113 of those appear on the wall. One of those was Captain Humbar Rocky Versace. He used to coach Bradley basketball in Peoria. Or his brother, his brother used to coach basketball. He was a captain in the Army. He was not only a prisoner of war who died as a prisoner of war, he was also a Medal of Honor recipient. He raised so much hell with his captors that one day they just decided it was, it was easier to kill him than put up with him. So that, that's how he lost his life. Uh, there were 245 Medal of Honor recipients during the war. 153 of those appear on the wall, in other words, they're deceased. There were the worst single one day of casualties during the war was 245, that was on January 31st, 1968. It was the start of the Tet Offensive, that's the Lunar New Year. And then in May of that year, 1968, 2,415 were killed. That was the most in one month. So if you think the single daily total and the single monthly total were 1968, what do you think the most was in one year? What year? 1960. It was somewhere around 16, 18,000 lost their lives in one year. That's why so much of the wall is comprised of people that died in 1968. Uh, true story. When a wall was being built in Washington, D.C., which I'm going to be going to see in two months, my son's are taking me. Uh, the brother, the deceased Vietnam veteran, whose name is on the wall, I don't know their name, this is a true story. He got his brother's Purple Heart. So when he was viewing them putting a the wall together and working some of the wet concrete, he had asked them if they would put his brother's Purple Heart in a wet concrete in memory of his brothers, and he said, sure, he would. sure they would. So you can honestly say the wall in Washington, D.C. has a heart. It's just his brother's Purple Heart. Now, other things that are interesting is the things that people leave at the wall. And say, say I went to Vietnam, I didn't. But say, I, or my brother did, because he did go to Vietnam. Say he had a drinking buddy and they'd like to share a Budweiser. Well, maybe my brother's name's on this panel here. So they might leave a Budweiser beer for my brother. Uh, maybe play cards with my brother so they could get the cards. Uh, Maybe they had a picture of you and your group when you were in service together, that would be on it. And all sorts of things like that just piled down. In D.C. they categorize those things and they keep them in a warehouse because eventually I think they're planning on, if they haven't done it already, building a museum to catalog and keep all that stuff. So, um, what's my train of thought here? Oh, and some of the things were big. And I asked her, guess, and I'll ask you, what do you think the biggest item was that's ever been left at the wall in D.C.? I think big. You're close. Motorcycle. Full. Harley-Davidson motorcycle. 
somebody knew somebody's name on that panel and they left the motorcycle there and he was out. So, and, you know, I find interesting stories like that. Another one, there were 4,000 military working dogs. Like, they're like sentry dogs. They could also sniff out bombs, bodies, uh, all sorts of stuff. Well, there were 4,000 of those during the war. 281 of those were killed in action. I never knew that until I worked the wall this last week. Every time I work a wall, I know more than I knew before I started working that wall. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. I think I gave you just about everything I remember statistically, and sometimes I forget. Still a lot more than what I know. Oh. <laughs> um, what similarities or differences do you see in your world as a veteran compared to that of those currently serving in the military? Well, I give the people that serve now a lot more credit because there is no draft. Now, whether I think there should be a draft or not, I'm not going there. I will not discuss politics with them within an interview. I won't discuss religion. I won't compare this war to another war because there's too many bad feelings you could bring up. But uh, I think the fact that our military now is all volunteer, for people nowadays not to respect those people, for people nowadays not to see a veteran walk in the street, even if you don't know them, and say hi, thank you. I mean, when they used to come home from Vietnam, one, one, once in a while they'd get spit on at the airport. They'd be called baby killers. Um, they were told a lot of times when they went on leave by their first sergeants. Now, when you get to a major airport, you, if you flew in uniform, you got a discount airfare. Now, once you get in an airport, get the hell out of your uniform and get in civilian clothes because you're not going to believe the stuff you hear and the, and the trash people are going to talk about you trying to knock on your windows of your car. And just the stuff they went through is just amazing. And one one way I try to teach the kids this, it's kind of funny, when I worked at Wall in Manitou a couple of years ago, they had so many kids came in because they had it there during the end of the school year. They would get three busloads of kids. There was me, my then oldest brother and a friend of his and so you wouldn't flood the wall with 150 kids all at once and then they get in the way they had like here different things you can see I take the group of kids here you take the group of kids here and take the group of kids here, and then kind of go on the merry-go-round well I was with my last group of kids and when I was done with them I was done with them they had seen everything they could see and in between time I kind of became friendly with the sergeant master sergeant hall out of the 182nd airborne in Peoria. And we chit chat and I'm talking to the kids and I told them, uh, you know, kids, see somebody on the street or whatever, shake their hand, tell them thank you, whatever. I said, and I said, kids, you remember what I told you about that? They said, yeah, we're supposed to shake his hand or thank him or whatever. I said, yeah. I said, see that guy standing over there all by himself? That's marching. And that's my, that's my sergeant all. I said, what did I tell you to do? I said, we'll shake his hand. I said, what are you waiting for? So they all ran over there in a single file. I started shaking his hand. And then I said, by the way, when you leave out the back gate there, there's two women Air Force airmen. Shake their hand, too, so they're shaking their hands. <laughs> so there's, there's funny stuff now. You want some sad stuff? Yes. About the wall. Yes. Pretty, something's pretty bad. Well, when you I, decide. When I worked the wall in Bloomington, there were people that went into the wall, and there was me. This one, and I was working night security, and from about midnight to five, didn't see a soul. The guy drives in the parking lot, starts coming this way. I contacted the people in the big tent. I said, be alert, there's a person coming. It didn't look like any of them got out of their seats to see if this guy needed a hand. He got to the section of the wall he wanted to be at. I approached him. I asked him if he needed a hand. He said, no, he wanted to be left alone. I said, fine. I said, I'll be sitting there when you're done. If you would like to talk, let's talk. He said, okay. He got done, he came down and started talking to me. He apologized for being short with me. I said, no, I understand it. And uh, he said, the reason I wanted to see my buddies on the wall, he was in the early stages of what they call pararescue. It was like MASH. Mm -hmm. And part of his job was to unload the wounded from the helicopter. A helicopter that uh, carried wounded veterans during the Vietnam War was called Dust Off because they came in, picked up the wound and got the hell out of there right away. The quicker they could do it, the quicker they could save lives. Not like World War II, it took forever. And uh, he said when uh, the dust off helicopters landed, 
He helped take the bodies off. Sometimes just an arm, sometimes just a leg, sometimes just a foot. And then he said, Fred, the last thing I did, I had to wash all the blood out of the helicopter. So that's his sad story. I uh, was working, well, first of all, I worked in Chillicothe. We had uh, golf carts. The wall was, you had to walk a little bit to get to the wall from where people were allowed to park. But we had golf carts that people needed to be taken up there, fine, bring them back, fine. Well, this one guy and his wife were going to walk up there. I approached him and said, you need a ride? And, and they said, no, they, they'd be all right. And I said, but man, you can't take your dog up there. You can leave it down here at the command center. We'll watch it. She said, no, it's just a little dog. I'll put it in the car and leave the window wide open. Because this is like 10.30 at night. Nobody's there. And she's it. I said, well, we'll keep an eye on it. And in between time, I was talking to her husband, and I said, your wife was telling me a little bit about you and that you were a Marine that served in Vietnam, and he corrected me right off the bat. No, I wasn't a Marine. I still am a Marine. I'm just not active duty. Once a Marine, always a Marine. He said, okay. I said, uh, when your wife comes back, I want to go up there. He said, yeah, I'll try. Well, he told me, Fred, I, I can't move. I said, you don't look like you have a physical problem. I said, well, what's keeping you from moving? He said, I'm this close to finding my friend's name is on the wall. I'm frozen. You just cannot move. And he said, well, I can get a, a golf cart over here. No. And I put my arm around him and kind of chit-chatted with him a little bit. His name was Paul. And I said, Paul, I know you are a Marine that served in Vietnam. And I'm just a airman that served during Vietnam. I put my arm around him. And I said, you know what, Paul? He says, what? Some way or the other, this airman's going to get your Marine ass all the way up. Excuse me. I got him all the way up there, but in the process of getting him up there, he's crying. And he's cursing the war, cursing his buddies being on the wall and not him. He's crying and reaching for a hanky, and he don't have a hanky. So I pull out my hanky, and I gave it to him, and he woke his ass. And eventually I got him all the way to the top. And then I said, Paul, when we get up there, there's a fellow Marine up there. Go, go help you look for the names and the coordinates you need to find the name on the wall. And it just so happened my brother was up there, so my brother helped him. And they, my brother gave me the information he needed to find Paul's friends. So I found a couple of them, but I didn't find all of them. But again, Paul's crying and crying and he falls to his knees. By then, his wife and his buddy had joined them. And I says, Paul, I'm not real religious, but I want to say a prayer for all the buddies on the, on the wall. No, I says, I'm not much. You're going to get one. Now. I said, I'm not much in the prayer. And I says, well, Paul, I know one thing you'd like to say to all of our deceased veterans, including your buddies, caps, caps that you would call as words. I said, Paul, would you like to say that? And he said, yeah. He says, I'd like that. I said, well, what I'll do, Paul, is I know the short version. I'll say a line. Your buddy will say a line. Your wife will say a line. And you can say a line. So we did that about four times, and we got three taps on okay. All of a sudden, Paul's standing up, and he's in a better mood and everything, and he said, thanks, he's going to he's gonna go now. I said, okay, but i got to go back down there, too. That's my duty station. I said, I'll walk in. I want to be left alone. This is my wife and my buddy. I said, fine, I'll be 50 feet behind you, and I guarantee if your knee hits the ground, I'll be there to pick you up. And as we were walking down the hill, he says, Fred, I got, eventually he caught up, or I caught up to him. He says, Fred, I do have a question to ask you. And I said, what's that, Paul? He gave me the stand hanky. I said, it's my hand, Paul. He gave it back to me. <laughs> Want another story? Okay. When I did the wall in Manitou, uh, one of the volunteers there said, Fred, we know you know a lot about the wall. This is my stepdaughter. She wants to help any way she can with the veterans doing the wall. What can you tell me? Or what can you tell her when she's helping? I said, well, if she sees somebody kind of lingering at the wall, be a little cautious if you're trying to approach them because they may have found their buddy on the wall and they may be reliving events that they don't want to relive and they may be crying. Well, it just so happens I met this guy the day before. But this young lady came up to me and she says, Fred, I don't know what to do with that guy. He's just standing there. And she says, I'm kind of afraid to approach him. I said, well, you come with me. And I approached him and tapped him, and then he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, you remember me from yesterday? He said, yeah. I said, I remember you. This young lady right next to me, she's learning to help with people viewing the wall. She was concerned about it. So I said, uh, 
I would get together with you and uh, let you know that uh, you could let us know that you're okay. He says, yeah, I'm okay. And he kind of looked at her and smiled and thanked her. And then I found out that same, that, that same wall about a day earlier, this one guy, Vietnam vet, would come in and sit right about the center area of the wall, but back quite a ways. I never noticed this guy from the day before. I never noticed him. I mean, they'd say he'd sit there forever. The next day, he was doing the same damn thing. I said, how did I miss him? I'm watching for other people that are having trouble with people at the wall. And this guy's 20 feet behind me, and I never noticed him. And that, that made me feel, that made me feel kind of bad. There's other stories I can't, uh, I can't think of now, but uh, that's why I enjoy it. A lot of people. Oh, this. Did I give you one before? No. That's the words to the bugle call taps. That's what I'm sure you. I carry them with me every time I do this. And if I run out, I got another 50 or 100 in my car. Thank you. You're welcome. I really appreciate that you came in and talked to us today. I've learned a lot from you. My, origin, my original dog tag, 43 years old. Last time I worked the wall, I thought I lost it. Oh, my. But I found it. I have another one that's at home. I never carry both of them. Thank you so much for yeah. coming in. When I take my first break in my